This is really one of the great honors of my career to once again interview Jane Goodall. It's been a while, it's been more than 10 years since I've had the opportunity to interview this woman of peace, a soft-spoken woman who says a whole lot that we need to do, I think, a lot better at listening to. And I know that you're very passionate, uh, Dr. Goodall, about a program called Roots and Shoots. So that's where I want to start. Tell me, first off, what that program is. Okay, well, it's, <clears throat> it's a program that started in 1991. It's actually almost be called a movement now. So it started with 12 high school students in Tanzania. It started because when I was traveling around the world, I was meeting so many young people, especially high school, university, who didn't seem to have much hope. And they were depressed, they were angry, or they were just apathetic. I asked them, you know, why, why are you like this? Well, you've compromised our future. There's nothing we can do about it. Well, we have compromised the future of our young people. And you hear, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents. We've borrowed it from our children, but we haven't borrowed their future. We've stolen. We're still stealing. But I don't agree it's too late to try and do something to heal some of the harm. So Roots and Chutes um, is a is a message that every individual matters and has some role to play, but more importantly, every single one of us makes some impact on the planet every single day. And we have a choice as to what sort of impact we're going to make. Every group of roots and shoots chooses themselves three projects. So it depends if they're rich, they're poor, they're in America, which part of America, in a city, uh, if they're in Africa, if they're in China, they will have a different environment, different customs, different culture, different religion. They choose one project to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And then they discuss, and then they roll up their sleeves and they take action. And they actually do it. And this is not only in America, it's all over the world. It's all over the world. It's been in as many as 100 countries, but sometimes, you know, it starts up and then um, the, the, the sort of life behind the program moves on or something, but there's still seeds planted. And we're in over 50 countries at this moment, but we've also got all what I call the alumni, those who've been through Roots and Shoots, and they keep their values. I mean, I meet them all the time. Like in China, people will come up and say, but of course I care about the environment. I was in Roots and Shoots in primary school. So we've got about 2,000 groups across China. Do you think that maybe children uh, or young adults are more open to listening to ideas than people of a certain age? Well, uh, I think that, that, that young people today are rising to a challenge because, you know, they, they realize what's happening. They can't ignore climate change. It's everywhere. And they can't ignore what's, what's actually happening, how forests are disappearing. They can't ignore about the plastic in the ocean, especially where they have access to television and just the internet. And so they understand what's happening and they're beginning to understand we better get together and do something about it or it will be too late. Has the internet been a good thing or uh, not. So you say have access to TV. I've been in parts of the world where people don't have access yeah. to TV, but they have their cell phones. That's right. And as long as they have electricity somewhere in the village, there's often one central place. Mm -hmm. You've seen these places and they plug in their phones, yep. but now they can go online and read about anything. Has that been a plus or not? It's both. I mean, we all know about fake news, don't we? I've heard that term. <laughs> <laughs> I think for some of us, fake news means one thing, and for others, it means something else. But anyway, um, it, it's a way of linking people together and getting messages out that's new in human history. Of course, it's been used for bad purposes. Everything always will be. Yeah. So the internet can, can be good or it can be bad, but it has helped us to, for example, having a march on one day for climate change to make governments try and listen. Uh, Greta from Sweden couldn't have done what she did starting this, you know, 
this um, marching around the world and one day off school and school strike. She couldn't have done that without the internet. Absolutely right. Um, how did a nice girl like you end up in a place like this? And here's what I mean by that. <laughs> there you are in Gambi. You're a researcher chosen by Louis Leakey with two others, uh, Diane Fossey and Baruta Galdikas, to study great apes. A woman, no less. That in of itself, at that time, was outrageous. Just thinking of a scientist who's a woman doing this. Now you're traveling around the world. You'll tell me how many countries. It's astounding, although I do want your frequent flyer miles as a result. <laughs> uh, Can't have them. <laughs> I need them. <laughs> you're changing the world. So how did you get from that place, which in of itself, I'd argue, pretty important, to doing what you're doing now? Well, you know, it, it all began when I was 10 years old and fell in love with Tarzan and dreamed that I'd go to Africa, live with wild animals, and write books about them. I had no intention of being a scientist. Women weren't in those days. And everybody laughed at me except my mother, who said, if you really want this, you're going to have to work awfully hard, take advantage of every opportunity, but don't give up. So anyway, I got there and met Louis Leakey. And he asked if I'd like to study the chimpanzees. So I was the first of what's been known as I think Leakey's angel system. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so I was the first one he chose. He wanted, he think he thought women would make better observers, more patient, and he wanted somebody who hadn't been to college, because he wanted someone whose mind was uncluttered by the reductionism of the scientific thinking of that time. Huh. And so, that is how I got to Gombe, and then. Why did I leave my dream world? I left because right here in Chicago at a conference in 1986, by then there were six other chimpanzee study sites. And Dr. Paul Heltney, who was head of the Chicago Academy of Sciences then, yes. great friend. Yes. And he said to me, Jane, let's do a conference. He wanted to do it. Um, great apes. And I said, can't the chimp, don't the chimps, their closest relative, don't they deserve their own conference? <laughs> was that with Barute and Johansson? No, no. That was different, okay. That was completely separate. Okay. That was totally separate. Okay. This was just me and Paul ah, inviting okay. chimp researchers to a four-day conference. And it was mostly to be about chimp behavior. But we had a session on conservation, shock, chimp chimpanzees, numbers decreasing, forests going, um, chimpanzees, mothers shot to sell babies, and the beginning of the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food. In some African countries, chimps are eaten, and sometimes they're used for witchcraft. And witchcraft? Then, yeah, the parts give you strength. And, wow. You know. But then we also had a session on um, conditions in some captive situations, like medical research secretly filmed footage of our closest relatives in five foot by five foot cages. And so I went to that conference as a scientist because I had a PhD by then, and I left as an activist. Hmm. That's how that began, 1986, October. That's, that's an incredible story, and Chicago has a, a lot to do with that, but Chicago has something to do with one of your best friends that you travel with, so I'm gonna ask, to be introduced to these friends, but you have one more that I don't see here at the moment. Mr. P? Mr. H. H. This is Mr. But H. That's Mr. H. Okay, yeah. sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. That's so Mr. tell me H. Mr. H's story. Well, Mr. H was given to me by Gary Horn, who lives in, Ro is it Rockford? Rockville. Yeah, yeah, Rockford. yeah, Rockford. Rockford, Rockford yeah. And um, he wrote me this letter and asked me for a photograph, because he wanted to put it on his office wall, Call it, headed the amazing Horndini, because his name is Gary Horn, H-A-U-N, the amazing Horndini. He went blind at 21 in the US Marines, decided to become a magician, was told it was impossible, he was blind. A magician? The, the kids don't know he's blind, and at the end he'll tell them and say, things may go wrong in your life, don't give up. He does scuba diving, cross-country skiing, skydiving. He's taught himself to paint, 
And in this little book he's done called Blind Artist, which you can get on Amazon, there's a portrait of Mr. H. Now, he'd never seen Mr. H. He thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee for my birthday, and I took his hand and said, Gary, chimps don't have tails. He said, never mind, take him where you go, and you know my spirit's with you. So he's been with me to 65 countries. He will be 29 next, next week. Doesn't look a day over 22. <laughs> And he's very famous. Yes. He's very famous. And he symbolizes the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems to be impossible and won't give up. Well, I want to ask you, that's you. Do you think that's you, by the way? Well, tackling the impossible. I refuse to say that healing the planet is impossible. Well, good, because <laughs> that's it's good for our children and grandchildren and their children. Uh, but... When you have world leaders like our current president saying, oh, but there is no problem to tackle, even, uh, that it's a hoax, not Chinese, my words. Chinese hoax. A ch yes, mm. exactly. But more recently, he's, he said, you know, well, maybe there is something like climate change, but it's nothing to do with us. So if <laughs> the president of the United States was sitting next to you instead of me, what would you tell him? I probably wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> well, what if he were? Well, I would, I don't know. I mean, very few, I, I, I would sit next to almost anyone and think that they would listen to think I could reach their heart. But I'm not sure with Donald Trump. How I do really you, don't know. So that is something tr true about you as a speaker. I've seen you speak several times. Yes, you present facts, you present information. Going back to the earliest National Geographic specials to the last time I saw you speak, you do that. You, you somehow are able to get into all of us as individuals. It could be 500 people in the room. It doesn't matter. Or watching you on TV, and I hope, same in this video. You reach into people's hearts. Yeah, by stories. Is it the stories? stories? Yes, but you also have to get a feeling for the person. And you but know, how do you do that when you're speaking to three or four or five hundred people? You well, don't I, know all of them. Then, no, then I can't. <clears throat> but you're able to do it. Well, that's, they call it Jane magic. <laughs> it is Jane magic. It's a gift I was given. And I think if you're given a gift, especially today when the world is a dark place, then you have to do your utmost to, to use that, develop it. So do you think some people perhaps our president, have such a closed heart? You don't, don't think know. you could I get mean, to? I, don't, I just don't know with him. M yeah. Most people, you know, even unlikely people, I've managed to, to get to their heart. So maybe I could, but it doesn't seem likely. But maybe I could. What do you think it is about him, his persona, that it has appealed to so many Americans? Same as why Brexit was voted in the UK, and I think the same as the yellow vests in France. There's whole sections of the general public that are being kept undereducated. They haven't had proper health uh, services, and they've become angry. They want change. There is a lot of anger, isn't There's there? There's a lot of anger, and so people want change, and they don't always understand exactly what that change will mean. They just vote for change. So now we have Brexit on our hands in the UK, and I mean, it, it's a disaster. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the environment. Uh, there's the oceans you mentioned, and uh, we've experienced it now where you're in the middle of the ocean, somewhere, anywhere, but in the middle of nowhere, and there comes along a plastic, plastic. bottle floating, or we've actually seen it. I think we saw it in the Galapagos once. It was somewhere where uh, it's, it's exactly what you see now in these YouTube videos. It was a, uh, a sea turtle. I don't remember the species, but it was a sea turtle with a six pack, you know, on its fin. And it dived and we couldn't even catch it. We would have. And again, thinking you're in the middle, there is no middle of nowhere anywhere. No, there isn't. Anymore. No, no there, I know a whole team found a place the furthest from land possible and went there, and the beaches were covered in plastic. I saw the video of it, it was shocking. Is the good news now is that we can shoot video of all this to make people more aware and they instantly get to see it? 
Yes, that w there's a growing awareness. We've got to get the change in behavior, though. That's, that's what Roots and Shoots is about. Mm -hmm. and they educate their parents. And you know, now, because people are more aware, like there are substitutes for plastic made out of, uh, I think it's citrus rind, potato skins, which serves to keep food fresh. I did and not know that. Yes. Huh. Um, you know, so because people are becoming more aware, our amazing brain, and, and this is sort of so weird, we've got, we're the most intellectual species to ever walk the planet, with no question. I mean, animals are way, way, way more intelligent than we thought, which is why I carry ratty and pigs. Pigs are as intelligent as dogs, and people need to understand that we're not the only thinking, feeling beings. And, you know, cow, cows that we treat like as if they have no feelings, no personalities, and that's not true. But, um, so right along with that. So yes. So I can't remember. What no, that's okay. So there's an initiative in uh, veterinary medicine that I wanted to ask you about. It's called Fear Free. It actually began in veterinary medicine, and and we now know that this is what made me think of it. Our dogs and cats have the same emotions we do. What's up here, the chemistry that's up here, is pretty much identical to you and me, right? Mm -hmm. We now know that it's not opinion, it's now fact. Yeah. And it turns out that the behaviorists and people who do what I do, actually some of us feel that a lot of cats in particular, but a lot of dogs too, actually think they're going to die when they go to the veterinary clinic because they are that terrified. So one veterinarian came along and said, we need to fix this. And it's easy. we now have tools that we can use to fix it. And then the dog trainers said, we love this idea. We want to be a part of this too. And the dog groomers are saying the same thing. And the behavior consultants, which is my group, saying the same thing. Does that make sense to you? And I ask you in two different ways, well three, based on what you just said about all these guys mm -hmm. having brain chemistry that we don't necessarily, and feelings. True feelings that we don't necessarily yeah, yeah that we don't necessarily think about for, for starters, uh, but also that I happen to know it was a dog that started it all for you in some ways. So does that idea resonate with you? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, when when I got to Cambridge to do my PhD, I'd been with the chimps two years, and I was told I'd done everything wrong. Uh, chimps should have had numbers and not names. That was science, and I hadn't been to college, you see. Uh, and I was told I couldn't talk about personality, minds capable of solving problems, and I couldn't talk about emotions, because they were unique to us. So back in 1960, it was thought there was a difference in kind between us and other animals. And I learned from my dog as a child that that wasn't true. You can't share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a, a rat, uh, a pig, a bird, and not know that, of course, we're not the only beings with personalities, minds, and emotions. And this is what I was writing about in the early 60s. And I, I couldn't have studied at that time animal emotions because I was told it didn't exist, only for us. Now you can study it. And now we know better. Now so it is this better. idea, which is just called Fear Free, but does it it's a good name for it, but does it resonate to, with you, do you think? Well, I haven't really heard much about this fear free, mm -hmm. but the, I, I certainly know there's ways of alleviating fear in an animal. And there's a lot of communication that goes on that most people wouldn't, wouldn't believe in, but I've had you know, many examples of it. Yeah, I think our dogs and cats are always talking to us, in yeah. a sense, and whether we pay attention or notice, I don't know, but they are always asking us questions. They're always communicating with us. I mean, for goodness sakes, we evolved with dogs, mm, from literally. Wolves. And we are killing wolves, coyotes. It makes me so angry. When we destroy, and, and my time is running down, so I don't want to be too selfish with my time, but I know I haven't asked you about this yet, and it's the forest. So as we destroy the forest, shortcut a direct question, are we going to destroy ourselves? If we continue destroying the forest and the ocean, then we will create a world that will be uninhabitable for our descendants. And that's why for me, 
you know, this is why I'm traveling 300 days a year. This is why I go to as many countries as I can. Um, because I care about the wilderness, I care about forests, I have a spiritual connection with something when I'm out in the forest. I care about animals, I care about children too. I've got grandchildren, soon probably a great grandchild will come along. Oh. And I, you know, what's their future going to be like if we carry on with business as usual? And you know, if governments would stop subsidizing oil and gas companies, if they would subsidize clean, green energy, then we could be off the grid. We could have a much healthier life. If we could ban the use of these agricultural chemicals, the pesticides and the herbicides, they're poisoning the food, they're poisoning the land. The soil is being poisoned. We're running out of fresh water. The great underground aquifers are not only lowering, but they're also polluted. So we're, we're gradually, and it seems faster now, polluting the world. So we've got to alleviate poverty, because if you're really poor, you have to cut down the last tree to try and grow some food in your desperation or make charcoal. We've got to change the mindset of all the rest of us, because we don't we all have more than we need? I have more than I need. Uh, I try to leave a light ecological footprint, um, traveling in planes, staying in hotels. I leave a heavy ecological footprint, but our Roots and Shoots kids have planted millions, literally millions of trees. So I hope that absorbs the CO2 <laughs> that I've created. And I I'm do sure. travel on a commercial plane. And then we must address human population growth. We can't just ignore it. And then there's corruption. These are the four problems that well, somehow with our intellects we have to try to solve. And it's very difficult to solve any of these with this political swing to the far right, where always economic development comes ahead of saving the environment. And how crazy is it to think we can have unlimited economic development on a planet of finite natural resources? Some places we've used them up faster than nature can replenish them. And where people have taken your advice. So I think of one example of Gambi, where that's been done and now they see the chimpanzees, in fact, as a, uh, as a value to them because it values their economy and they better understand what they have is worth a lot. And I've seen that myself and seen the mountain gorillas at Virunga. They're the only species of great ape, to my knowledge, that is actually stable and maybe, maybe increasing in population. Their numbers are about, they're okay anyway, relatively speaking to the other great apes. And I would argue it's because of ecotourism as well. It's um, ecotourism managed properly. And unfortunately, ecotourism uh, often gets out of hand and destroys the very, the very nature that people travel so far to see. But, you know, at, at, around Gombe, we help the people, the people living in poverty. We improve their lives in the ways that they suggest. So we give them the tools to improve their lives, to find ways of living that don't involve cutting down the forest. And they now understand that saving the forest gives them clean water and clean air. And it's not just to save the chimpanzees and the other wildlife, it's, it's to save future generations of their people. So they become our partners. And where there were bare hills around Gombe, there's now trees come back. And we've got the same program in six other African countries. And that could be, and well, I'd argue you've created a model. And that could be, but it is a model if people listen. It is a model, yes. If people listen. Yes, but we can't, you know, too many animal rights people keep humans out of the picture. But it, we're all in this together. We're it's, animals. We're, we are animals. Yeah. And, you know, people living in poverty will do things because they have to. Yep. Yeah. What makes you happiest? Being out in nature alone, especially in a forest, um, or with a dog. Ah, I like that answer. Why a dog? Because dogs are very special. They always have been. I mentioned earlier we evolved with dogs. I argue they understand us better than we understand them, perhaps? Well, I think some of us understand them very well. Um, 
is it the loyalty of a dog? Is it? It's the loyalty. It's just the affection. It's just the companion. I mean, we now have proof that uh, a dog in a classroom will improve the work of children. Yep. A dog sitting with autistic children for the first time they may read because they read to the dog. And uh, dogs will help uh, people in hospitals even to heal faster. Yes, and even horses. Yes, yes. So it's not only dogs. No, it's not it's only dogs. It's that we are all connected, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. I saw a video on your page uh, that I shared of, of a gentleman who helped raise an orphan condor. A large, yeah, as yeah. an adult, yeah. even as a subadult. Yes, because he I came think rushing he, to greet him. Yeah. He put his head up here. Yes, I know. A condor. Yeah. So it's not only, yes, I agree we have a special relationship with dogs. There's no question about that. But other animals yeah. too. There's no question. Animals can can help people. I have one more question for you, because I've gone over time. I know you have. <laughs> <laughs> You're aware of that. One one question. What is your vice? My advice is. No, well, your vice, like, is it chocolate? Is it? What is your secret? When you're oh. all alone, is it chocolate? Well, a, a square of chocolate, is that a vice? Not necessarily, no. A little tot of whiskey, is that a vice? I'm not here to judge. Well, I, I can't think of any real vice that I have. Well, um, I signed that petition that's going around about you winning, earning the Nobel Peace Prize. I sure hope you do, not only because you deserve it, because that will give you an even larger platform to spread all the messages that you spread and in only a way that you do it. Thank you so much for everything you do. It is my honor, my honor to sit here to talk to you. Um, you don't know how exciting this is for me. <laughs> you don't, but what's most important, I think, is that your, mes your messages resonate and that more and more and more people hear your mm -hmm. messages. Well, okay. you know, I, I haven't said the most important message. Yes. So let's end up with that. Yes. That every single day, every single one of us lives, we make some impact on the planet. We have a choice as to what kind of impact we're going to make. If we start thinking about the consequences of the little choices, what do we buy? Where did it come from? Did it harm the environment? Did it result in cruelty to animals? Is it cheap because of child slave labor? If we begin asking those questions and making ethical choices, it may seem nothing if I do that, but if millions and then billions of people make ethical choices, and so that's why we must reduce poverty, that's why we must have a different mindset for the rest of us and think about population growth on a planet with finite resources. We can all make a difference, even me. Especially you, you've got a <laughs> radio program. Yes, Dr. Goodall, thank you so much. Thanks.